Hi, I'm Julia from GU Teaching Resources, and today I'm talking to Melissa Stolfer from Mrs. Stolfer's Music Room on TPT. I'm sorry if I've got that wrong. And she is um, another long-term member of the music crew. Um, it's going to be much easier. Hi, Melissa. I'm just going to call you Melissa. <laughs> How are you today? Yeah. <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> that works for you. Oh, good. As I said, um, it's not a name that I am familiar with. With I don't think I've ever come across it besides you. So trying to pronounce it and get that accent, the Aussie accent out is not easy. Um, That's all right. Everyone call everyone here in the States says Stouffer, but for all of the Americans here, they don't give me any money. So you have to say it differently. <laughs> oh, okay. And so, so just, just, for those of us who are not American and have no idea what you're talking about, it's obviously, it's a food label or something, yes, is that Yes, they're right? like a huge fo uh, frozen food brand. In fact, I get targeted ads from them. I get people commenting on my business page sometime, like talking about Stouffer's lasagna and they don't have as much meat in their sauce as they used to. And I, I mean, like, it, it's very funny to me. Okay, they obviously but... didn't read the bit that says music. <laughs> No, they didn't. <laughs> Nothing on my page about lasagna. I like lasagna, but yeah, yeah. No, okay. No relation. Oh, no. <laughs> Hi, Melissa again. So again, um, thank you for explaining about your name um to those of us who have no idea. But can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey into music education? Sure. Okay. So I so I don't know if I ever like set out in my brain to say I'm going to be a music teacher and this is what I've decided it just kind of felt like the natural thing and, and I will just say flat out I owe this to my band director from middle school who was this like four foot ten spitfire of a man with like massive arthritis like he played the piano with his knuckles it took him 30 minutes to walk to his car after private lessons and I used to help him out at lunch like the school I went to uh the upper middle school kids could pick like lunchtime jobs and you know he'd get distracted from me trying to help him organize his room because he couldn't walk and, and do any of these things he was in his late 70s when I met him and um when he died in 97 which was my freshman year of high school he was 82 just wow. to give that reference yeah. um but he uh he'd get distracted and he'd be like Melly come here and he, he you know he taught me to transpose so like at one point like you know, we had a jazz band and I'd be sitting there with like the tenor saxophone part, which I played, uh, the trumpet part, the trombone part, the alto part. And he just taught me to sight transpose and say, you play this part here, you play this part here, you play this part here, you play this part here. Um, my middle school experience was in band was amazing. And high school was the complete opposite. The program was kind of falling apart at the school. And I kind of, um, I my freshman year of college, I went to a very big name university and I was actually a pre-law and I just like the first week of school, I'm like, oh, this is not me. And I like was switching into music classes and um, something a lot of people don't know about me. And I, I've not really widely talked about this, I don't think, but I actually did not get into the music school on my first try or second or third, or I don't remember how many. Um, so I went in and I was the very big fish in a very, very itty bitty pond in high school, was not prepared at all. Yep. Um, so I did not get in and I transferred to a different university in Michigan, which I loved and kind of the sort of an unspoken promise of, well, come here and probably next year you'll be in the studio, mm -hmm. uh, which did not work out. But in the process, I've started taking voice lessons and joined choir just kind of like for fun, um, which was terrible for me because I was used to having an instrument in my hands to perform yeah. Yeah. and the whole blow to my, you know, ego was difficult to kind of overcome. So I actually have a psychology degree that I got in the process of trying to get into the music ed program and oh, the semester I graduated with the psych degree um, thinking that if it didn't work out I was going to go into music therapy um, and go for a master's and kind of go that route um, possibly working with like the elderly yeah um, I uh, got into the voice program at that university and my lesson teacher who was one of the professors there came and like tracked me down during choir and like was thrilled and excited and and that's how I got my music ed degree um getting into TPT so I got you know I got out I finished I did all the the stuff you're supposed to do and my first job I was traveling between several schools and I at one point I picked up you know 
other schools. Like uh, in Michigan, we have something called shared time where it's you're hired by the public school district. You are teaching in a private school, but it's, it benefits both schools. It's very weird. It helps mm -hmm. with like the, the funding. So the public school district gets funding for those students, but then they can, they're, they're also supplying the private school teachers. Apparently it's legal. I don't know exactly how it works. I could not yeah. tell you for the life of me, but it's how I had my job. And at one point I was working for two different districts and I was in four schools and I was traveling a ton and I was teaching everything from like infants to like middle school band. And I, at some point got extremely sick of one, not having money for any resources because mm -hmm. most of my schools have anything and I didn't mm -hmm. have budgets um you know occasionally I'd say like I really need this and you know they'd kind of try to find funding for like you know inexpensive versions of what I needed yeah um and um forgetting things because I was traveling between four schools like there were some days that I was at two schools and I'd yeah. like you know print something out and cut it and then I'd accidentally leave it at the other school and finally I'm like this is ridiculous you just need digital resources that you can just take with you and you know I didn't have a district laptop I just had my own personal thing so I was like making stuff and that's what I started using um there were a couple small whiteboards like not even like on the wall like I was mm -hmm. teaching I think if people are watching this they a lot of people know me for like my um my cart blog that went yep. kind of viral in 2020 um and I was, if you want to talk about all my teaching situations, I list them all in there. There was a ridiculous number of rooms, shared spaces, classrooms, yeah. people walking through rooms, like, I mean, like yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Um, and I was writing on like little whiteboards, like upside down. I got really good at doing that. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of how I, I fell into making my own stuff was because I had no budget, I had no resources, and I kept forgetting the things that I was making that were paper because yeah. four yeah. schools, you know, across two districts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, I don't know how you did it. I'm I'm listening to it going, that just hurts my brain. Like, oh, my a goodness. A lot of coffee and a really, really good calendar. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm just thinking that the imp as you say, the the implications of moving between schools and also different, um, just knowing where everything is and, as you say, trying to tr yeah. keep track of what's actually at each school and, oh, geez, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in wow. some yeah. ways it was easier to not use resources like that some schools did have. Like if one school had like a few ORF instruments but the other three didn't have anything, I, I wouldn't use them because it was like trying to write lesson plans was yes. ridiculous was um and I could reuse some things but a lot of the classes weren't necessarily the same age group so it wasn't yeah. just this is great one this is great two like I had one class where I had a Montessori group of well, first and second graders one day the next day I had the third and third through fifth graders together and then the third day I had all five grades together so that they could work on stuff for their concert together for an hour. Um, and then in a different school, I had a K2 class, which the Ks were just kind of thrown in so they could have music, but the kindergarten program also accepted preschoolers. So there were like some four-year-olds with some second graders. That was fun. Um, so I did a lot of like trying to like alter the curriculum so that like we were still progressing and it, it was a logistical, like it was, yeah. it was just a lot. Yeah. So this is where I kind of, I mean, and this is one of the reasons I kind of went towards the Kodai method too, is because yeah. I could kind of go in that direction and yes, still have some sort of sequence and structure. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah, I can just craziness. totally imagine that it was just crazy. And again, just listening to that, it hurts my brain and just the, the <laughs> again, how many things you're having to juggle to get kids still learning and enjoying music, let alone dealing with all the other stuff that goes on as a teacher. So yeah. 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 Wow. So um, what actually inspired you to become a music teacher? Was it that middle grade, um, middle school grade band guy? Well, it, you know, it, it, it really must have been, but like I said before, I don't know of when I ever really just said, yeah, I'm a music teacher. Like it just was like the thing that like, yeah, that's what I want to go do. Yeah. Like it was always just kind of the thing I kind of figured I would do. Yeah. Even though like I didn't prepare really through high school. Um, so I went to a school, I went to a Catholic school. We had a really 
dinky band program at the boys school next door I was the big fish um and also my my sister died my freshman year of high school oh, um, so she was two years younger than me so it, it was kind of like one of those like well I just kind of like went through the motions and I still did all the, like the grades and the things like that like and and you know I I kind of went to the big name university because it was like oh I got in I guess I guess where I should go even yeah. then I'm pretty well, even though this is really not who I was so I'm not yeah. I don't know when it really hit me that that's what I was going to be it just kind of felt like the right thing for me yeah whole time I just didn't have the right setup to do it right out of college I guess that's yeah but again I think like life experience gives you those other things so yeah Yeah. I think there's always a benefit to um look it doesn't matter I say to my kids because you know I teach older kids back doors and windows you know there might be one straight path to something which is lovely but if you don't get in, that's okay. There's always a back door or a window to climb through so or walk through. So, you know, it, it doesn't matter how you get there as long as you get there. So, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. and that experience, I will tell you, has been very helpful when I'm talking to kids that are nervous. And I'm like, look, it doesn't matter. You can you can mess up. And, yeah. you know, sometimes the only person in the room that knows is you. And then other times. Yeah. Yeah, they know. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> and, and that's okay. That's exactly right. We've all been there. Well, as musicians, we've all made mistakes on stage. <laughs> Growth over perfection. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I remember one, um, we call them mad nights. So it was music, art, dance, drama. And so it was just performances for everything and or exhibitions of art stuff. And um, we as teachers decided that we were going to do something, which is fine. And it was, um, you know, we don't need no education, you know, the good old Pink Floyd song. And so we're in the middle of the song and I'm standing there on the guitar and the guitar strap broke and it was like okay I've got to try and hold this guitar and move over and sit on this amp and still keep playing and I was just could not stop laughing and it was just like ridiculous and the kids thought it was wonderful and I'm like I'm still trying to play <laughs> funny. it was funny I'm glad I, I don't think it's on video but thank goodness because we were not dressed uh, we were dressed in costume and I can't remember the costume but it was you know I did not look like me anyway <laughs> something different (laughs) so what is your main instrument you said that you obviously ended up in uni at uni um or college um as a vocalist but what did you actually start with well I started on clarinet um I wanted to start on flute but I have short little uh carrot hands (laughs) um so not only are they short but you could say they are definitely wider at the bottom I have little carrots and um they were not ready for flute when I started band in um like the end of third grade that's when we started with my right. awesome director and um so I started on clarinet and in sixth grade um my band director taught private lessons after school so we were taking lessons and one day he looks he, he side eyes me and he's like you know Melly, I want a big band <laughs> you want a saxophone? and I'm like okay so I got a tenor saxophone and um I, I, so I don't know where this like really started. I'm pretty sure it was Wally. And then somebody had given me, um, my aunt had given, because I liked big band music, my aunt had given me this, um, Glenn Miller CD, which was not like mm-hmm. actual recordings of Glenn Miller, but like recreations of some yes. of their big songs. And I, I mean, like Glenn Miller is like, yeah, he was like my jam. He's still yeah. kind of like my jam. Like I was on a class trip with some of my students, um, a number of years back their eighth grade trip in dc and we went to arlington and like they helped me track down his headstone and i cried and they're crying because i created a bunch of glenn miller lovers and um in fact i don't know if yeah. you can see like right there kind yes. of like there's like a watercolor one of my students yep. put like a glenn miller quote about bands having their own sound and like wrote it yep. out for me so that's from her like uh-huh. like yeah. That Nougat Choo Choo would come on and my kids were all like, oh, no, like they're they're like we're getting phone calls. They're supposed to be at dismissal. I'm like, there. Where's the kids? Um, They're in my room. They're watching Glenn Miller. And I tried to kick them out 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's a good thing. But yeah. he put that saxophone in my hands. And that was like th- that was that was it. Um, yeah. So in my heart, I am a saxophone player. Um, I actually did get accepted to a different program for saxophone, um, but I stuck with the the voice teachers who uh the voice teacher who um really supported me and gave me as much you know 
work and confidence as it took. So I stayed with Mary and she was amazing for me and things, which I, I have to say though, that's been actually really nice because I feel like I can really approach things from yes. both ends. Yes. Um, and, yeah. and that's been really helpful. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and going back to what you, I think you said before, um, you know, it's hard when you're an instrumentalist and you're used to something being in front of you. And then as a singer, you take that away. You feel no. very like exposed um on stage because it's just it's just like it's just you so you know I'm a guitarist originally and then switched to voice same sort of thing um because it's sort of what I had to do um yes and I'm certainly like I would consider myself much more a vocalist these days because again arthritis in the fingers like it's it's you know I'm getting to a point where I, I don't ask me to do anything classical I just can't like my I just can't chords fine um but yeah and I say that same thing to my kids who are guitarists and vocalists and because the way we've got things set up in our in our state for our um, exams I said you actually get you are going to be better off either guitar or either vocals and they're like oh but I like to sing and play yeah but your guitar skills are not as good as your vocal skills so get rid of the guitar (laughs) for the exams yeah. just sing <laughs> I just want you to sing yeah. <laughs> but it's as you say it's a really hard thing taking that instrument away when you're yes. so used to something in front of you it's sort of like this little invisible barrier isn't it like yeah. people can't see me behind the saxophone or the clarinet right. well they can't so the focus is on something <laughs> besides you <laughs> that's right that's right so and yeah then, and then you know like the whole you know you're singing and then you know open your mouth more show more of your teeth drop your jaw like and you're yeah. like oh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very you know yeah yeah but a colleague of bizarre. mine who, um who's um a saxophone and, and a drummer and um she she was laughing because she had to teach vocalists you know in her class and she's going but I did all right and I said of course you did Jody," because yeah you know, she said it's the breathing thing you know as a saxophonist you know what you've got to do for to get that proper breath control and that it translates beautifully as a vocalist so you know that cool like yeah so anyway we that's another <laughs> another rabbit hole we could go down but let's not go down there <laughs> Okay, that might be another video. Um, so yeah, how, right. how long have you actually been teaching music then, Melissa? Oh, so I've been, <laughs> so I, I want to say it's been about 12 years because I've had a few years now where I've been out of the classroom. Yeah. Um, so I, I left my classroom during COVID, which was traumatic yeah. and awful for me. Um but I have a congenital heart defect, um, oh, well, actually a couple congenital heart defects and asthma and with COVID and I was teaching preschool through eighth grade general music choir and band. Yeah. Um, so having that range of kids yeah. uh, who, and my job is to have them, you know, yeah. teach them how to blow hot air at me uh, was mm-hmm. not going to work. And I, uh, now, not last year, two years ago, I said, okay, you are either going to get pregnant and stay home with a baby for a little while yep. or go find a job next year, which was this current yep. past school year. And I did have a baby last summer. He just turned one. Um, so I'm staying home with him for a little yep. bit. And um, right now I'm doing some stuff for Oak and for MMEA, which is the Michigan Music Education Association. And um trying to blog in the 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 free time I have and uh, (laughs) I I have to say I'm really proud of myself for keeping up with like at least the blog right now because I have like this like if somebody went into my computer and found a list of blog posts that I want to write they'd be Mm -hmm. like oh you're never gonna get through all of this so Mm -hmm. I was like you have to keep doing this so I've been doing that at least um some of my other stuff like I I feel like some of the products I want to create are kind of on my back burner right now but you know yeah 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 I, little ones, so. I hear all of that Sometimes. and it was funny when you talk about COVID and and um I understand the implications and like again I said we teach older kids and um that year we came back I think it was 2021 the year of 2020 they changed the rules for us so normally my kids can have an ensemble to support them obviously in in their HSC performances the high school certificate okay. so you know external markers come in and do that <laughs> Then they changed the rules because of COVID and we had to have the markers so far away from the performers. And if they were, they could 
only be a duet. You couldn't have any more than two performers and they had to be three metres away from each other. I mean, that's stupid. Like you could imagine, like we're in a classroom and we're trying to, you know, have these, and, you know, how do you do that sort of ensemble communication when you're over there? Like it, right. it was especially ridiculous. For, especially for young musicians like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, you're getting into like collegiate or chamber groups where they're a little yeah. more nuanced and things, but the, for, oh that that's that had to be so hard oh it was and one of my girls was a string player and she had this beautiful jazz ensemble that she had been working on and then it's like I'm sorry sweetheart we can't do that like so you know luckily she's you know from a very musical family and she had a younger brother who was really good on guitar um he supported her it was the only way we could go but and then the following year same deal we had a saxophonist and we literally had to I'm not kidding had to mark out an area in the back of the back corner of the classroom and that was the only spot she was allowed to play because of all the rules and regulations it was just yeah. <sighs> yes, I, know. So, I know so yeah I'm glad that's you know it's it's obviously still scarred us hasn't it like you know COVID yes, has not gone away definitely. you know there's still yeah. things that you know um yeah. Anyway, right. again, that's another rabbit hole we can go down. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad to cover up that rabbit hole for a while. Oh yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. So, <laughs> what age groups do you actually, um, when you were in the classroom? I think you sort of talked about it a bit before, but what age groups did you actually teach? So I, so I student taught <laughs> with high schoolers. Um, but my, all of my working jobs were younger. Um, I worked in a Montessori that had like a an infant room so I actually had as young as six weeks old in my classroom now obviously six week old is just sitting in a bouncer not doing anything but I'm still yeah. trying to sing at the baby mm -hmm. um and then I've had all the way through eighth grade that I taught so I've taught um lots and lots of preschoolers um because of the Montessori school I was in was predominantly preschoolers like yeah. I had about 100 preschoolers or so 150 wow. a year um but I've taught that. I've taught kindergarten through fifth grade choir, first through eighth grade choir, first through fifth grade choir, middle school choir, uh, middle school band. I founded that program on a cart with no budget. And then I've taught, you know, K-5 typical classrooms. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And then all the mixed age classrooms. <laughs> yeah. Again, I, I just, um, it's it's so different what you guys do to what we do. And it's it's just, I, again, it's, it blows my mind how much they actually expect out of you as a music teacher. Like, yeah, 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 it's, yeah. It, like my, K, my certification is K-12. Um, right. And a lot of times they'll throw on, you know, hey, add this pre-class, pre-K class in, which is like yeah. a four-year-olds or young mm -hmm. five. Mm -hmm. you know so it's yeah. interesting um I don't think as many people do teach preschools but there's a lot of people there's you know there's a really high percentage of people I think that get early childhood yeah um which I had not had a lot of experience with them at all I really was not like a little kid person I'm still not really truly like a little kid person <laughs> which is funny I'm known for like my like elementary things I think yeah um, but really somebody said you know right now you have to choose you can only teach this for the rest of your life I might say middle school band because yeah. I I love yeah. middle school I, I do too love. and you know as I said I teach grade 7 to 12 and when I first started teaching I um we call it casual teaching so you just you know the school calls you up and you're there for the day and so I'd just be oh. doing casual teaching or substitute teaching and I was went into a lot of primary schools because I had a lot of friends who actually were primary school teachers and was, oh yeah come over for the day and whatever else I mean I didn't mind kindy kids but they wanted to touch you and they wanted to play with your leg and undo your shoes. And huh. and then and then they wanted you to do up their shoelaces and it hadn't been raining and their shoelaces are wet. It's like yes. <laughs> So give me give me year seven to twelve any day. I'm um, um yeah, you know, uh yes. Yeah, so I I, I had I, this sweet yeah. little preschooler. I loved him. The only class yeah. he would sit so and this is in the Montessori, he did not he didn't want to sit on the line for this, he didn't want to do yeah. that, he didn't want to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> that four sit on the line for my class so like if he had been behaving well in the classroom the kind of reward was to be able to sit right next to me right. and this, this little this he was four at the time god love him he's the most adorable little thing and he had a little stuffy nose and he leaned over and used my pants to wipe his nose and i'm like <laughs> 
<sighs> uh, okay. Oh, like in the teeth, the, the aid is like cracking up and I kind of <laughs> trying to keep it together. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to sing and not laugh and oh, oh, bless their little hearts, eh? Oh dear, that's yeah. funny. Um, okay. Um, so what is your favorite part about teaching? I'm pretty sure it's not about the kid wiping their snotty nose on your leg. Um <laughs> oh. No, you know what? My favorite part is, is that like that moment when you can see that like something clicks for them and they're like, oh, and then they like think that it's cool. And then they're like off on their own little like tangent in their brain where they're trying to figure. I mean, and it doesn't matter for me if it's like a preschooler where it clicks or like if it's a middle schooler and it's like something else clicked or they get the tone right. Like it does not like it's that that moment that something like goes click and they get it. And yeah that that's that's my favorite part yeah and I look it's funny I think nearly um everyone I've talked to that's sort of that is the thing that moment when you see that that child get it and yes. and it's like oh my goodness you've got the bug you poor kid you've now got that music bug and you know yes. <laughs> it's, it's like it's bit you it bit you and you've got it like I, I had um parent teacher interviews um only a couple of weeks ago and um one of the, my boys in year seven he's a beautiful kid um very sporty kid and in this particular class it's more girls and maybe seven boys and the rest are all girls so originally I had him sitting away from the other boys because he could not sit still I was like no I need you close to me and then I mm. let him sit with his mates but when he's sitting with his mates we were just doing ukulele so it's behind me okay but we're just mm. doing ukulele and he took it off it just went like he, he it just penny dropped and it was like wow you've got it and I had interviewing his parent with his parent and I said, um, I said, sweetheart, I take it you're actually really enjoying music. He goes, yeah. I said, so, but your mates don't and you want to be part of the group. He goes, yeah. I said, okay. So do you want me to be the mean person next term? Because we you know we're on holidays at the moment and I'm going to put you in a seating plan. I'm going to put you in a seating plan and you're not allowed to sit next to your friends. Is that okay? And he goes, Yes, <laughs> because then he can, <laughs> because then he can actually play the instruments and be yeah. actually keen. So he, because he was trying to be the, you know, and that I suppose that's that middle that's age, hard middle for them. Yeah, it is. They want to be. They're so influ um, right. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, influenced by their peers, but he didn't yeah. want to see appear that he was actually enjoying it. It's like I can yeah. see you are. Like I know right. you've got well, that bug. That Sometimes it's just that one that like, even though they might really enjoy it, they don't want to look like they're enjoying it because yes. they don't want to be vulnerable. And that's, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's hard for those middle grades, really, especially. It is. And, and as you say, it's that peer influence and all those sorts of things. So yeah. let's pick one of your instruments, just one. Sure. <laughs> and what is your teaching approach if you, with that particular instrument, what would be your approach? Sorry, it's a hard question, I know. Mm. She's thinking. <laughs> okay, so I guess I'm going to go with, I guess I'm actually going to go with clarinet, which is an odd okay. one for me to say because I, I recently taught um, clarinet lessons to um, a student. And the thing I that I always kind of like that gets people tripped up is that crossing the break thing. Yes. And you know, there's that whole like build up of crossing the break and it's yes. difficult and blah blah blah. I literally never told a, a child this is difficult. This might be hard for you yes. because then they get this like thing in their yes. brain that it's gonna be hard. Like I'm just like, okay, this is your new note. Play this new note. Oh, yep. it didn't come out. Okay, let's just try this. And here's like, you know, the register key. And 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 that's it. Like that, that's my thing with teaching the clarinet. Like I I am not pandering to this. Oh, it's difficult. It might be hard for you. <laughs> like that, that's like a thing for me. Like, don't tell the kid it's hard. And then yes. if they're really struggling and they're frustrated, then you can say, Yeah, this is a really hard skill to master. It's okay. It takes time. Don't yes. worry about it. Yes. Like, but don't tell them beforehand. That's that's my big <laughs> there you go. I love it. And you're right. It is, I think, is that part of your psychology degree coming out in you? No, I think that's just me. Like I, I, like I, I would much rather not tell somebody something's difficult until afterwards because I know, so I, I'm naturally like a super ridiculously anxious person. If you tell me that it's going to be hard or if it's going to be like difficult, I will like hem and haw and like, yeah, 
don't want to do it. Like I, I'm yeah. very much that person. So I'm kind of a mind over matter sort of yep. person yep. sometimes. Yep. 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 Just, just get over it, get over yeah. it yourself and do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's hard convincing myself to do that, but I at least try to teach that with my kids. So I think you've just basically talked about then that some of the cha um, challenges students face when learning your instrument and you've, you've talked about how they overcome them. So again, it's, it's that mind over matter and just like, let's just do this and then yeah. we'll work it out. Yeah. 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 I love that. I love it. Um, So this is a hard one and I've, this has sort of stumped a few people. So um, yeah. we'll see how we go, but what is your favorite lesson or concept to teach and why? told you it was not easy <laughs> oh, I have so many though yeah I know I, have so I know many. um gosh okay I'm gonna go with my favorite lesson okay um so my favorite lesson is it's a music history lesson yeah. and it's actually a uh, shocker it's Glenn Miller <laughs> So I, I've loved it, it. It's not really Glenn Miller though. It's actually the Nicholas brothers, but I use a Glenn Miller video to kind of go this way. So no, I, 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 you know, I spent a lot of time as a kid, like with big band music. And then I was really into like, um, what is it? TMC, TCM, T T M C the classic class Turner classic movies. It's like a cable channel. Oh, okay. Here in the States. Right. And you know, I don't have cable any longer, but I was growing up, I'd be at my grandma's or something or, or just at home and they'd show like old movies. And yeah. um, there is a movie that was made in 1941 called Sun Valley Serenade. And it was um, it, it, Sonia Henney, the ice skaters in it. And she's this um, refugee coming from Norway and she is sponsored by somebody who's in um this orchestra which it's really Glenn Miller's orchestra but it's yeah, you know yeah. Phil whoever, uh, in the movie and you know there's the, oh my goodness she's a grown woman thing and it's how it's inappropriate blah 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 blah, blah. Yeah. so they get a gig in Sun Valley for the season and they go over there and she's like decided that she's in love with the guy and of she's course. gonna follow him <laughs> and, and it's adorable yeah. um and, and you know 1940s kind of innocent movie yeah uh but then there so then his current girlfriend does not like her and they it comes out that Sonia Henney's character likes skiing and she's skiing and they're you know on their slopes and and the girlfriend's the singer for the band and she's mad and she's kind of waiting around so they're like okay well we're gonna run this chart like while we're waiting for them to come back and it's Chattanooga Choo Choo yep which was the first gold record and um the it's this beautiful like you know panoramic of the band playing and then it cuts and then it's the nicholas brothers and dorothy dandridge and they're just phenomenal of course um so i always kind of do like a history lesson on the nicholas brothers which is my way of being able to show chat nuga choo choo but at the same time it's not <laughs> really about like like you yeah. know glenn miller is kind of like a like he's important to me, but he's he's not going to be like one of those big names that I feel like kids should like. Yes, I hard know. Like I yeah. loved it that my students know, but like you know, and I like introducing things as I can. But like the Nicholas Brothers were so like influential and just kind of mind blowing like talent that like I feel like it's an injustice to not show those yeah the to his students. So I'd show them the video and then, you know, we kind of segue into stormy weather when they're jumping down the stairs and the slides yep. and like the million splits. And then if I have time, um, Kalamazoo, which was from the movie Orchestra Wise, which also featured the Glenn Miller Orchestra. But the, <laughs> the Nicholas Brothers at the end, they're actually like walking up the wall and like jumping yeah. and doing the split come down. It's just amazing. Yeah. And then it always turns into, wow, these guys must have been millionaires. And I'm like... Well, actually, so I kind of get in yeah. that little bit. Of, well, this is the reality of being black in 1930s yeah. Hollywood. Yeah. And you would think that these guys would have had just everything in their lap, but they didn't because that's no. how they were treated back then. Yeah. So I get yeah. that little yeah. bit of alerting moment for them. And the kids, the kids are the ones who always bring it up, though, because yes. I, I would never be the person that would be like, well, yeah, and these guys, they didn't do this. They didn't do that. But 
Yeah. And the kids would get that moment of, wow, these guys were just amazing. And they influenced all these people. Yeah. But they didn't get that kind of acclaim that they yes. would have if they were out today. Yes, so, yes, yes. And, sure. and that's probably one of my favorite lessons because it always goes like the exact same way. The kids are just mind blown watching them dance. And then they must have been millionaires. No, no. It, it, I always love that lesson because the kids just go home and they, 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 you know, I always get at least a couple who went and looked them up on YouTube later yeah. and, you know. Yeah, yeah. Really, because it was such a cool thing, but still somehow applicable to like what they can see dancing. It's still, it feels still relevant to them because they see yes. amazing dance techniques that would still yes. be amazing to them if they turned on so you think you can dance. So. Yes, yes, yes. I know what you're saying. And and yeah, and I think that's, again, one of the beautiful things about music is we can relate so many things in history um, and what's happening in the world into our classroom and and through me, that music is that vehicle that we can do those things through. And yeah, it's just, that, again, that lovely little moment that the kids realise that how much music has influenced so many different things and um, whether it be yeah. good or bad. So, yeah, yeah. so, yeah. So yeah. what's one of your memorable teaching moments that you'd like to share besides the snotty nose on the knee, on the leg? <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Um, oh. So I think... I got to say my band kids. Yeah. I got to say my band kids because they were just, I, when that class left, like when they graduated, I was devastated because they were the first group that went through three years of band with me at that yep. program that I built from scratch. Yep. Like they all had to give like, a, this is a very small school. Yep. Um, so they had to give graduation speeches and four of them mentioned band mm -hmm. in their speech. Like they're the ones who helped me track down Glenn Miller's headstone. Like yeah, just recently, I actually had one text me. They said, I saw in the mood on TV and I thought of you, <laughs> um, but they were, they were fun. And I think the memory I have to go back to is the very first time they played in public, which was like October. And it was our special person's day, which was kind of like grandparents day. Yeah. But yeah. Special people. Yeah. Um, you know, for kids who might not have had a grandparent yes. that could come. And uh, we, so it was, we had had like a month and a half of rehearsals and I had prepped just two little pieces, very short pieces out of essential elements for them to play in public this was like their first real thing yeah and um several of those kids had parents that worked at the school so like several parents were in there even though like yes you know they weren't part of the special person's day and they played when the saints go marching in yeah which when my middle school band director died um he we got to play at his funeral yeah and we played a piece called at a Dixieland jazz funeral, which yep. wildly features yes. when the signal marching yes. in. So for me, it kind of felt sort of full circle. Yep. And they played that and like, there's parents crying and the kids are all excited and mm -hmm. I'm like trying to not cry. And that, I, I, that feels like one of my favorite teaching moments because it was like something that like, it's like, we kind of imagined that, yeah, we're going to try a band program and we're going to see how it goes and maybe it'll work. And it was it, it was just kind of like, oh, it, it worked and they're playing something and it's real and it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Like, the, like there's all these like great moments when you teach and you have yep. these moments of like, that was awesome. This was good. These kids sounded great. But that felt like a, wow, I really changed something kind of moment. I think that's yeah. got to be my favorite moment. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love that yeah. so much. Yeah. I even have, you can't see over there, which I won't show because I, I believe in student privacy, but like, yeah. not in block over here but like there's a block over there yeah um when they graduated we took a picture together and they're yeah. actually over there on my shelf too so yeah yeah I've got a, a wall that's got all my past students like my, yeah. my senior <laughs> students on them um I need to change the wall it's not big enough anymore <laughs> yeah that's what happens when you've been teaching so long. Alrighty, so we're going to. Um, I'm just going to give you, ask you a few quick questions, and then we're going to talk about sure. the um conference coming up. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, what's your favorite go to restaurant? Oh. <laughs> 
am so basic. It's Starbucks. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, what do you I, love like, about Starbucks? I'm saying go to, because like, if I'm like on a quick, like, oh, I need something to eat. Like yeah. I can usually find something there that like, like I, I'm not a really big fast food person per se, but yeah. I mean, and I didn't realize Starbucks is fast food, but like I can get yeah. some coffee. I can get like an egg sandwich. I could get egg bites. I can get, yeah. you know, a snack. I can get, you know, a protein box or something. Yeah. And like, there have been days, like when I've been like on the road for stuff that I've might've had Starbucks for like two meals out of three yeah, because like you can get lunch and dinner there and coffee. So, yes. yeah. um, that's probably my go-to. Yeah. I and get water, that. water is good for you. <laughs> That's right. What are you currently binge watching? Guy Fieri's Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. Say that again. So Guy Fieri's Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. So okay. he's like a Food Network guy, and he has this show that's been around for forever, and he travels to these, like, diners, drive-ins, and dive bars and like tries their food and kind of highlights local restaurants yeah it's just kind of fun to see some of it but my, my husband and I struggle to agree on <laughs> shows often because I would much rather watch like the same thing over and over or quick comedies or yep. something like that and he wants to sit down and watch like heavy historical dramas and I oh. just don't I don't have the attention span for that kind of stuff unless I'm really in the mood for it which is yep. Yeah. They struggle um yeah. but food network shows tend to be stuff we can agree on we have like a cheap uh streaming plan for discovery plus and that one happens to be on there so we were yeah. like okay let's watch this yeah sounds good but, to me sounds good to me yeah. it's, it doesn't take a lot of brain power those shows and and some days you just need yes. something that you can enjoy well, right and then you know my my kid is on the floor and he's playing and i'm trying not to like watch the tv but we kind of want something on just for a little bit of noise and i've yeah i I've actually not put on any television for him at all yet. He yep. has not like sit down to watch TV. Um, the only like real thing I've showed him is the uh, 12 song from Sesame street. That was right. like from like when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's something that he's not interested in. He's not staring at it. So that that's kind of been like a good option for us. Yeah. Yeah. So while, while we're saying that um, two shows you need to think about for actually three, that are Australian shows, which are really good for kids. The Wiggles, have you heard The Wiggles? I've heard of The Wiggles. The Wiggles are amazing. Okay, so The Wiggles are okay. amazing. And um, we took my granddaughter to a concert last year and she fell asleep. So it was great. Um, I enjoyed The Wiggles because um, <laughs> my kids grew up with The Wiggles. The other one is Play School, which is an Australian um show by the abc which is um yeah it's a, not a commercial tv station abc play school beautiful i love it i watch it with my granddaughter it's wonderful and the other one is bluey Have, i knew you, you were gonna bluey? say bluey in there i've bluey. heard good things about bluey bluey is awesome um, my granddaughter again she's like she's two so she's only just sort of talking but before she could sort of talk we didn't realize like what are you doing and she's doing what bluey does and bluey goes oh oh oh, oh, oh and she was doing it <laughs> that's cute She's so good. She loves Bluey. Bluey? 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 Yes, darling, Adorable. Bluey. So, okay. Well, again, we, we got sidetracked. Um, what, are you <laughs> what are you currently reading? Um, Lots of kids' books. I'm actually not reading. <laughs> I'm in between a few things right now. And I've got, <clears throat> so besides the crew conference, I'm doing um a Kodai summer camp, which is sort of like a two-day long workshop that um Michigan Kodai is putting on so I'm presenting like a day and a half worth of stuff with uh, my friend Zach for that wow. so I've not been <laughs> I don't have time to read right now unfortunately <laughs> um yes. if I'm being completely honest if I'm having a moment of downtime I'm scrolling TikTok <laughs> yeah I get it I get it yeah I, I love the honesty um spot is on repeat here for um any of any of the spot books that's what my granddaughter loves she just loves spot yeah. and i <clears throat> i sort of think that spot's mum should be reported she loses him all the time so anyway <laughs> <laughs> anyway so it's summer holidays um which you don't really get a holiday when you've got a one-year-old um but what what would your perfect day look like sitting in a pool okay that's it yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's actually what I did during COVID. I got myself a Beverly Hillbilly pool. And I say that because it was a blow up, but I chlorinated it because that's gross. And no, chlorine yeah. is good. 
Yeah. Um, and I got myself a raft for it. And I would just sit in there and read, like I'd get up in the morning, I would work, do whatever I was doing. I'd log, work on school stuff, whatever. And then like, come like t- one, two in the afternoon, I'd grab my book. I'd go sit in the pool until dinner time, And I was super happy. <laughs> I love being good. in the Sounds good. Um, what's your favorite snack? Hmm. Maybe string cheese. Oh, really? It's really easy. Yeah, it's okay. not messy. String cheese is probably a pretty good one. Okay. I always end up sharing it with the dog and now the baby. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It it happens to be like that, doesn't it? So yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. But anyway, okay, well that's that was really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's talk about the conference now. So can you let us know what are you actually doing in your session for the virtual summit or virtual conference, okay, so I should say? I actually have two because if if you've been around the crew long enough, you know that I am not short winded. Um, so I can talk a lot. <laughs> and um, so the first one I'm doing is no more belt tests. And yep. I'll be talking about kind of restructuring your recorder program to be more like how we teach the rest of the time, because yes. for the rest of the stuff we teach, you know, we're talking about growth mindset. We want, yep. you know, yep. to learn a concept and go on. And then people get into the recorder and it's like, oh, we got to test. We got to test. We got to test. We got to, why are we testing them? Like, yeah. Yeah. Like they don't need to test every single new note they learn. Like it, nope. it, it feels very kind of contrived to me. It was a pain for me. And um, I learned a lot from being my own feeder in the the school I left right at, you know, at COVID, I was my own feeder. So I had preschool through eighth grade yep. and I'd have kids that would do great through belt testing. And then I'd get them in band in sixth grade and they're like, I don't know what this note's called. I don't know what this is. What's this? And I'm like, oh, yeah, what are you doing? And I realized they were basically just memorizing songs they knew yeah and not really learning note names and, yeah. and it was frustrating and I kind of it, it, besides that there was a lot of I don't know how this goes yeah I don't know what this like, like it's so we'll talk yeah. a lot about restructuring and how you can do this um and and I'll kind of teach you and walk you through how you can make this work for you because I don't think the point of learning the recorder should be to test like our life depends on it or mm-hmm. just to prepare you for band mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um yeah. And the other yeah. one that I've got, which is the, it's actually the last session on Saturday, but you'll want to stick around. Yeah. Um, and it's talking about classroom management. Um, but this is not going to be your typical classroom management sort of talk. Um, we won't be going over the hard and fast rules. And it's it's going to be a very interesting look, I think, for a lot of people. I've done this one before. Um, in fact, I did this presentation at the Michigan Music Conference in January. And there were a lot of people who were like, yeah. Wow. I never thought about that. Like, yeah. it, and it's stuff that music teachers, I think, naturally think about, but we don't really think about how it can affect um, our, our classroom management. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> so I think you sort of um, talked about what motivated you to choose both those topics, um, basically out of frustration <laughs> for both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And just like, you know, like I, and I think now too, people are really kind of like feeling that like post COVID, like I can really get back into recorder. I'm really getting it. Maybe I lost some things. It's not feeling the same as we got back. How do I kind of work with this? Um, so that I, that one kind of felt like good timing for me to talk about this one. Um, and then the other one I think is just applicable all the time. And I hope that, even if there's just one thing in there that I say that helps you kind of yes. get a little better control is, is yeah. you know, yeah. it's yes. a good thing. Yes, I've got a, a young colleague um, that we work with and it's only his second year teaching and he was our um, prac teacher, our um, pre-service teacher. I don't know what you call them there, but um, and he, he's lovely and the kids love him. Classroom management is one of those things that, you know, especially when we're early in our career, we all struggle with. So I'll be pointing yeah. him in this direction and say, go watch him. Please yeah. watch those and this sessions. this one is good even if you are not like an elementary teacher. I think yeah. there's a lot that could still apply. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I agree. I did this for a bunch of choral music ed majors um, in April, and most of them were looking at middle school, high school jobs, and they were like, yeah, this is great. 
Yeah. So hopefully yeah. there's stuff in there for everybody. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think, again, we've just sort of talked about how these will benefit the music educators that um, are going to watch your session. Um, but is there anything else that, they, that you know, they're going to get out of each of these sessions that's going to really help them? I think that there's always like takeaways. The one thing I love about our particular conference is that you can go back and rewatch them and, yes. and have time to process things, which I yes. think is so important. Um, if you're from Michigan, you want to watch them live because you can get those sketch credits, which is kind of like our, it's like a, like a credit out, like a just, uh, how do I say? It? It's almost like a professional development hour yep. um, that you, but you have to watch it live for Michigan. Yeah. And it goes towards our certificate renewal, which um, yep. you can go back and rewatch, which is really helpful. Yes. Um, and that's, I, I mean, I've revisited sessions from so, several of our friends before and like, yeah. okay, what did about that okay yeah I really like that and I wanted to go back and rewatch it and yes I, I love that about our conference I think it's really helpful yeah it is and again the thing that I love about the whole conference is it's it's for music music teachers by music teachers it's these are people who are you know we're all been there done that and we we know what's working in the classroom right now so yes. yeah yeah for sure so um it's been really lovely talking to you, but where can people find you on social media besides TikTok? Are you actually on TikTok? Sure. Uh, <laughs> so I do post on TikTok very, very rarely. Um, I did a very non-music ed post the other day and I just kind of did a spend the weekend with me and I showed a few pictures of what I did over the weekend. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, so I'm on TikTok and YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Um, it's always Mrs. Stoffer's Music Room or Mrs. S. Music Room based on how long they uh, yeah. let me have of a handle. Yeah. Um, but I'm kind of everywhere um, and I'm trying to be a little more active um, now that I'm out of the, the trenches of newborn life and yeah. young baby <laughs> life and getting better sleep and stuff so uh yeah I'm kind of everywhere and then of course my blog is mrs stoffer's music room.com and I've also got an Etsy store um which was my COVID creative project <laughs> uh this started drawing stickers for fun and I actually do make all of my own stickers here um I've got a cricket over there and I print yep. them and it it, it it became a very soothing sort of relaxing yes. thing for me to do. Uh, so if you're looking for some fun stickers to, to update uh, some water bottles or tech, you can head over there. Yeah. Um, and I have a few other things over there as well, which are kind of just fun little projects and stuff. So yeah. Yeah. And yeah obviously, I'm, I'm in all the and, places. <laughs> and on Teachers Pay Teachers, you are? I am Mrs. Stoffer's Music Room on Teachers Pay Teachers. <laughs> awesome, awesome. In fact, this is, August 1st is my 10-year anniversary. Oh, wow. Which, if you're watching this, you're going to be the first to know. Uh, you might want to stay tuned for what's happening on August 1st on my social. So maybe you want to go follow those. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm keen to know what you're going to do. <laughs> yeah. That's look. That sounds like fun. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you, Melissa. Um, I've really yeah, enjoyed yeah. it, and I really can't wait to see your two sessions. Um, as I said, there's just so much that um I know I'll get out of them as well. So, um, even though I teach older grades, as I said, you, we all get something out of everybody's experience. You know, the uh the recorder one. If you are an instrumental teacher, may actually be really interesting to you because it can definitely apply to instrument teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like there's definitely a place that this could fit into to instrumental instruction. Yeah, I uh, yeah, um, I said I'm I'm hearing you in, in all sorts of ways. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it was wonderful to talk to you, Melissa. So thank you, you so much too. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. This was so fun.